Is America facing a dystopian future? We'll explain. It's Friday at the Labor Network. I'm Mark Harrison, and WTF is next. Nineteen eighty-four, *The Water Thief*, *The Hunger Games*, all past popular novels set in the not so distant future from the time of their writing, when the human race has fallen into complete dystopian societal breakdown. What is dystopian exactly? Well, the term utopian describes a society that's conceived to be perfect. Dystopian, however, is the exact opposite. It describes an imaginary society that is dehumanizing and as unpleasant as possible. It is a no kidding setting where a few at the top have amazing wealth and live in splendor, while the rest of society lives in walled off communities filled with crime and sickness where only the luckiest get to emerge and occasionally service those living in that splendor. It is a society where the few dictate the rules to the many and where the many fight for the scraps that remain. Food is scant, healthcare is non-existent, housing barely inhabitable. The few hate the many, and they want them out of sight and out of mind, unless they need something cleaned. There have been several events in our lifetimes that have led to a weakening of the working class in America. The weakening of unions and a justice system that has turned against them with almost every ruling since the mid-1960s the recession caused by the fuel shortages of the 1970s, the power shift toward the wealthy that saw massive corporate takeovers that used overly funded worker pensions to leverage those hostile buyouts and the eventual eradication of pensions as part of the compensation package for most corporate employees and the shift of 401ks that fueled the ongoing rise of the stock markets in the 1980s, the 2001 9-11 attacks, and the financial meltdown of the 2000s. In all of these instances, the middle and working classes fell farther and farther behind in their ability to earn and save and spend. The four biggest drains on our society at large are poverty, healthcare inequality, wealth inequality, and wage stagnation. Indeed, take a drive to certain parts of our inner cities in our most rural and poor communities, and you will see dystopian sub-societies already in existence, where healthcare long ago left, law enforcement no longer ventures, and where whole families have been destroyed by complete and utter lack, and by drug and alcohol-fueled deaths of despair that most of us could never imagine. Yet, with each passing event I just described, more and more of us have joined these shadow societies. And now, as we face the single biggest health and wealth crisis we will ever know in our lives, from the coronavirus pandemic and its ensuing economic meltdown, our leaders flounder. The elected powers that be in our nation's capital have taken to hiding behind the politics of division, claiming the other side is always to blame. And while we watch our nation burn, our wealthy classes run from the possibility of illness to their private country sanctuaries. The rest are left behind to once again add to the dystopian underclasses that steadily grow among us. We face a dire decision as a nation and possibly a world. This time must be different. This time, if we don't stop the trends of the last 50 years, our stories will no longer be the subject of fictional dystopian novels. Rather, our stories will be the facts that future generations read about in dystopian history books. There is an election in November. Which will you be reading in the years to come? I'm Mark Harrison for Labor This Week, and I'll see you next week.